when you talk about Michael Phelps, you have to talk about the genesis of the multi-medal winner in the pool. And it all began with the man that we're about to talk to right now. Mark Spitz had the poster that every kid had in their room in the 70s with those seven medals across his chest so uh, well, well lined up and the mustache and his arms folded. And he also, people don't realize that he started, really started the swimming revolution in the United States. That's when you saw every neighborhood have a swim team when kids were getting in the pool and it was like, yeah, yeah, I'm swimming everything because Mark Spitz, he was the Olympic hero for us of the Munich Games. He joins us now and Mark, Thanks for joining us. And how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. I, I got to ask you, what's it like watching Michael Phelps right now? After you really were the guy who set the standard, what are you like? Is there a camaraderie? Do you feel what Phelps is going through as you watch him? Well, I don't know if there's a camaraderie between the two of us. I've hardly spoken to him. Uh, just briefly, sometimes giving him an award that he made the Olympic team and stuff like that. I've given him awards for swimming and different functions. Um, and he's basically gone up and thanked everybody for the award. So it's been a small conversation, to be honest with you. He um, uh, sort of rejuvenated, not my career, because I'm not in swimming anymore, but you know, having a record that was 36 years old, all of a sudden that record was mine, and then I became focused of how great he really was. That sort of brought to light what I had done. Um, you know, watching him swim, he's schooling everybody, to be honest with you. He's just mm. incredible. He lost his focus, as far as I can see, from the Olympic Games that was in Beijing in 2008. And it was hard for him after winning eight gold medals and breaking my record that he focused and he, I don't think he trained hard enough or whatever it might have been in the Olympic Games in London four years later. And he had some losses and I think it really got to him. And he said he was retiring, but uh, I said all along that that's not going to last long. And it didn't. I think it lasted for like 14 months. And he was back in the pool training and he had some things that were happening to him in his life socially and and, uh, you know, he got scolded for having some kind of an alcohol issue with a speeding ticket. And um, he got his act together last year. And he's got a fiancé and he's got a new son. And he's got uh, a, a different set of objectives. And he is now, as I'm speaking with you, has won four gold medals. And, mm -hmm. I mean, he's got two events left, one tonight in the 100-meter butterfly. It's its toughest event. I mean, he usually wins that event, but he wins by hundreds of a second. And, uh, you know, keeping that in mind, he's 31 years old, but there's a teammate he's got, Anthony Urban, that was in the yeah. 2000 Olympic Games in the 50 freestyle, and he won that, and he's qualified in the finals uh, this evening to, to swim that again. And, I mean, so it's not out of the realm that Michael could stick around and be 35 in Tokyo in four years from now. And, I, you know, since he knows only his whole life swimming, and the thrill of winning and the fact that he loves competing and racing, I, I, I really went on record about two days ago and said, you know, he's swimming so well. In his mind, if instead of swimming six events in Tokyo and he swims one or two, he'll figure he doesn't have to work as hard and he might stick around. So guess what? We'll have to wait and see for ourselves. But I, I think it's a strong possibility. I put a dollar on it. Let's put it that way. All right, I hear you. Um, let me ask you this. How hard – is it to walk away from something you've done your entire life? You had a career goal and options outside of swimming, but still it had to be tough. And how hard do you think it'll be for Michael when he finally does hang it up? Well, there's a, two differences. Uh, one major, and that is that at the time I swam, you couldn't be a professional. So for me to make a few dollars, which I did, mm -hmm. um, I had to give up the sport. And it was something that was sort of done, you know, prior to my going to the Olympic Games that most people who had, been in Olympic Games and then approached the year of the age of 22 or 23 or whatever after my college scholarship uh, had exhausted, which it was ironically on that same year in 72, I needed to go on to dental school and I had other focuses. Um, today, if the rules had been the same back then, then, you know, I would have been able to make, I would have been able to make the same money that I made by turning professional, but my sponsors would have encouraged me to stay in the sport and I probably would have as well. So I probably would have gone to the Montreal Games four years later. I mean, look at I wasn't chasing Mark Spitz's record, or I wasn't chasing now, for an example, somebody that's chasing Michael Phelps' record. So, you know, I had been to two Olympic Games. I had two gold, a silver, and a bronze in '68. Go to Mech and go to uh, uh, Munich and win seven gold medals and seven world records. That I had anticipated a year before that every single race that I was going to do was going to be my last, and I sort of relished the fact that that was the end of my career. 
Look, at, if if you ask me, if if Michael wins tonight and wins the relay tomorrow, I mean, six gold medals. That's a great way to finish. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's got like what he would have like twenty. He's got twenty two gold medals right now. Yeah. If he wins twenty four, if he wins two more gold medals, I was just pointed this out the other day, that he will have tied the amount of gold medals that the host city Brazil has won in the all time ever since the Olympics has ever been invented. So he's won as much as the country has had over a hundred and some odd years. <laughs> So that's quite an accomplishment. Hey, Mark, where do you keep your gold medals when you have so many? And do you ever loan one out? Do you ever let anybody touch them? You know, they've been in a bank vault since the moment I touched ground coming back from mm-hmm. Munich, only for the reason that I didn't want somebody to think that they could come and visit them next in my home. And they've been there ever since. So do you ever go visit them? Do you ever go see them? Oh, I think we might have lost Mark. Walk off. Maybe. I don't know. We might have lost them. I think, yeah, we were having trouble. Fritzy, work work on that. We got to get Mark Spitz back. But that's amazing that he has not seen his medals since Munich because when you think back to the Munich games, remember, that's when the U.S. basketball team lost. They lost to Russia. Um, and when they lost to Russia, they refused to accept their silver medals. medals. So those silver medals are still in a bank vault in Germany. So those guys have never picked him up. Doug Collins never went and got his silver medal. And so it's interesting. That's defiance. Yes, that's defiance. But Mark Spitz won his. And, and like, you know, he did the poster and he did all that stuff. And his are sitting in a bank vault. That's pretty amazing to think about. It's just, you know, those medals. I'm sure so many people come to his house or they just hang out or he shows up someplace and they're like, dude, where's the medals? Bring the medals. And also people need to remember during those games that, while Mark Spitz was being celebrated and there were things going on athletically, we will never get over what happened with the, the athletes from Israel. But let me get Mark. We've got Mark back. Uh, hey, Mark, let, let me just recap real quick. Do you ever visit the medals? Just go see them? Uh, no, I've only seen them actually three times. Uh, once to take them out for a picture that I was paid for by a French magazine. That was about five or six years after I had finished swimming. And then... Uh, on the anniversary of each of my two sons' birthdays at seven years old, I took them out and placed them on their shoulders uh, and hung them around their, their necks, actually, the same way I took my picture, you know, years before. So it's sort of a, a, it was a personal thing. It was kind of cute. <laughs> They're so small. <laughs> my kids at that age of seven, the medals are practically on the ground. <laughs> but they have that iconic picture because... I mean, I don't know a kid in America who didn't have that picture or know somebody with that poster. And um, let me ask you this. Do you ever think about growing the mustache back? No, not at all. No. You know, um, I had it. I I grew it out of spite because my coach in college said, you got to look like the All-American and not to have it. And then I grew it. It took so long to come in that uh, I went to the Olympic trials in Chicago in 1972 for swimming for the Olympics. And, uh, there were, there were, everybody was talking about my mustache. I figured, well, maybe I shouldn't save it off. They're worried about my mustache and not figuring out how to beat me. So it worked in the Olympic trials, and I kept it through the Olympics. And uh, it sort of, it, it was sort of that weird because everybody was shaving their heads and wearing baseball yeah. caps and you know, I mean, bathing caps and whatever to go fast. And I just said, hey, heck with this. It was working, and I didn't want to change. Wow, that is amazing. I do want to ask you: Is there gamemanship? Or was there gamesmanship or trash talk back then? Because we saw what happened with Phelps and um, Chad LeClo. And does that kind of stuff go on in swimming? Well, back in my day, not really. Um, look, at uh, we're in a different time. You know, we've got Twitter, Facebook, everything else happening. I mean, people have an opinion, and they're going to give you your opinion, whether you want to hear it or not. And <laughs> I think that uh, there's a little jealousy involved. And mm-hmm. look at Chad, you know, stuck it to him in the Olympics. Uh, yeah. And that's what all competition's about. And to be honest with you, there's always a Chad in somebody's life. There was a Chad in my life, a guy named Doug Russell that beat me in the 100-meter butterfly in Mexico City and took the gold medal away from me. I got a second, and I was the world record holder, and I didn't get to swim on the relay. So this guy had the race of his life, wins the gold medal in the individual event, wins the gold medal in the relay. And, uh, you know, so... That was the reason I stuck with the sport for another four years. And, and maybe that's the reason that Phelps is so strong today. You know, what happened yeah. to him four years ago in London. Yeah, it's it's a great point. Mark, thanks so much for taking the time out to join us. And um, look, I got to tell you what an honor it is to talk to you. You're a guy who I, I watched every one of those 
races when you were in Munich and I, I had the poster. And so it's great to talk to you. And I'm just, uh, and bring those medals out, man. Every, one more time. Just bring them out. Take a new picture. All right. <laughs> no, listen, I don't have to do that. I'll let Michael Phelps do that. And you know something <laughs> with all due respect, you got to watch this guy because it's happening in our life and it may never yeah. happen again. Records are made to be broken, but this one is quite incredible. Thanks so much, Mark. Mark Spitz, one of the greatest of all time and um, a man who changed swimming in America. Remember, always look back to the moment that changed, like, the culture. Mark Spitz changed the culture of this country and made us all appreciate swimming. The Dan Patrick Show, weekday mornings on Audience.